tale of a mirror and the lamp neither here nor there but long ago there once lived a bedouin sheik named amir who was known for his golden heart and cunning mind he had a younger brother a valiant warrior named ghazi who was strong of heart and body many peaceful years passed under their leadership until one year there came a storm season unlike any other the winds were so fierce they tore down the tribe's tents the sun was so hot it dried up water and blistered people's skin journeying had never been so difficult and the brothers were at a loss for how to provide for their people then one day the tribe chanced upon an ocean of shifting sand and knew they could go no further for they had reached the dreaded sand sea it was then staring at the endless expanse of sinking sand that amir had an idea at moonrise he called his brother to him and said beneath this ever-shifting sand is the world of jinn tales have been told of jinn who claw their way out and come to this world for revenge he patted the small satchel he had brought with him it is here that i shall wait to meet with one of those fearsome jinn ghazi who had been perplexed by his brother's plan said what do you hope to gain from speaking with the jinn it would sooner tear you apart than talk to you amir only smiled the jinn are powerful but i have the mind to outsmart them if we are to survive this season we will need to have their magic and so amir described his plan he showed ghazi the items in the satchel a pair of iron shackles and a simple oil lamp and told ghazi he would need three weeks in the end ghazi agreed to lead the tribe through the desert to the golden dunes where they would meet so it was that the two brothers parted ghazi to the dunes and amir to the edge of the sand sea where he waited for days with nothing but a cloak to keep him from the burning sun by the time a jinn emerged the sheik was starved and thin still he forced himself to bow as the creature approached the jinn was seven feet tall with eyes of burning fire and skin like golden sand its face morphed with every step a jackal's one moment and an eagle's the next it was a thing of such terrible majesty it would have made the bravest of men run for the dunes the jinn stopped before amir with a laugh oh what is this scrap of a human i see before me it would be a simple thing to crush you beneath my boot amir responded in a voice made raspy by lack of water o oh, mighty jinn i have no reason to beg for my life the sun has baked my body and weakened my eyes and i am approaching death's door but alas i mourn the life i lived as a hunter i was well known in the desert if you gave me a bow and arrow no creature stood a chance against me the jinn thought about this it debated the merits of killing the man or of forcing him to be its servant ultimately it decided a slave was more useful than a corpse so it snapped its fingers and conjured a bow and a quiver of arrows for amir prove your worth then the jinn said become my hunter and i will spare your life fail me and i will devour you amir consented and he and the jinn ventured forth amir hunted for the jinn every day and though he was not as strong as his brother he had spectacular aim he had not been lying when he said he could fell most creatures this was how the jinn came to be reluctantly impressed by its human servant and how over time it came to trust him tell me o mighty jinn amir said one day why is it that you do not hunt surely your eyes are better and your aim truer than mine the jinn responded we jinn are as mighty as gods hunting with tools is beneath us why complete tasks even a human can do and tell me mighty jinn what things can you do that a human cannot the jinn laughed and said i can perform any feat no matter how impossible for i am one of the seven jinn kings and the power of the world is at my fingertips amir was thoughtful can you make the world move the jinn clapped its hands and the ground trembled and cracked beneath its feet can you make the sky scream the jinn whistled and the wind sliced through the sky and tore the clouds asunder can you make the clouds cry the jinn sighed and the clouds above them let loose torrents of rain you truly are a god mighty jinn amir exclaimed and he bowed before it as the weeks passed amir challenged the jinn to other tasks one day he said i have heard tales that your kind is crippled by iron is this true can you withstand its burn the jinn hesitated but its pride outweighed its fear so it told amir that it could indeed endure the burn of iron amir took the shackles from his satchel and dared the jinn to travel with them on its wrists 
The smug gin allowed this. Immediately, after the iron was set on its arms, its legs became heavy as lead and its senses clouded. Yet, because it was a proud creature, it only gritted its teeth and said, You see, I am a king and cannot be defeated by iron. So the two continued on their travels, and now it was Amir who led the way, for the jinn could barely stand. Mighty jinn, Amir said one day, I am useless without your magic. Will you not take off the shackles so you can create fire for us and halt the desert winds? But the jinn refused to doff the cuffs, thinking that to do so would be a weakness. Instead, it asked Amir if he had any other items in his satchel. And when Amir gave it the oil lamp, the jinn drew runes upon it with its blood enchanting it. It blew fire into the lamp and told Amir he could capture anything within it, be it fire or wind or water, and commanded to obey him with the words, You are bound to me and you will serve me. Over the next few days, Amir tested the limitations of the lamp. He trapped wind and sand and even stars in it. The bottomless lamp fit all manner of things. By the time Amir and the jinn arrived at the golden dunes, Amir knew it would work for his plan. That night he approached the jinn with the lamp in his hands. The jinn, thinking he meant to release their captive fire, sighed with relief. Instead, Amir held the lamp out and said, Hear me, mighty jinn. With this lamp I bind you by your own magic. From this day forth you will be my servant, as I have been yours, and you will do everything I ask of you. The jinn lurched to its feet and rushed Amir with fire in its eyes, but Amir was unafraid. You are bound to me, and you will serve me, he said, and the jinn was forced to kneel before him. The jinn cursed and hissed, but it could not resist when Amir commanded it to follow. Together they made for the sheik's camp. Amir's return was celebrated by his tribe, who had feared him dead. He commanded the jinn to produce a grand feast, and the starving tribe ate and drank enough food for three men each. Afterward, when their appetites were sated and everyone was sleeping, Ghazi approached Amir and pointed to the lamp where the jinn now slumbered. Amir, your wit and cunning have indeed brought us great prosperity, but what do you plan to do with the jinn? To abuse its power would be unwise. Amir shook his head. Nonsense. I served the jinn for many weeks. Now I am forcing it to do the same. Come tomorrow, you will know my plan. The next day, Amir had the jinn king construct walls to protect the tribe from the fierce winds. Then he ordered it to create a town, one that grew as more and more Bedouin came seeking shelter. The jinn did the work of a hundred men in mere weeks. Never before had such a prosperous city been created in so short a time. When the creature was done, Amir commanded it to build a palace so he could watch over his tribe from on high. The jinn reluctantly constructed a palace from the purest white marble and built minarets so the sheik could see everything in the desert. When it was done, the palace was the most remarkable building in the land, too grand for even a sheik. So the people named Amir Sultan and begged him to be their ruler. They dubbed the desert metropolis Medin, and it became a place for trade to flourish. Amir went on to take a wife and have many children, and it was in this way that Medin's royal bloodline was established. While Amir ruled from Medin's golden throne, the jinn plotted behind his back. Ghazi's fears had been correct. A man with too much power was blinded by it. One day, Amir gave the lamp to his wife and told her she could command the jinn while he was away. Amir did not realize his mistake until he returned from his hunt and found his wife dead. He had forgotten to tell her to be clear in her instructions, and so when she had ordered the jinn to procure a feast, it had poisoned the food. Amir was racked with grief. He locked the jinn in the lamp and gave it to his brother, whom he made Cade of his military. You were right, Ghazi. Amir said with tears in his eyes. I relied on power, and it destroyed me. We must bury the lamp to keep this tragedy from happening again. And so saying, he bade his brother to bury the lamp so that none could ever find it. Ghazi rode hard and fast, and when he came to the sand sea, he threw the lamp into the sinking sand and stayed long enough to watch it vanish. After mourning his wife, Amir resolved never again to rely on magic, for it had made him greedy. He ruled Medin until his son took over, and then his grandson, and so on and so forth. Hundreds of years have passed since Ghazi threw the lamp into the sand sea. But while humans eventually succumb to death, the jinn are near immortal, and legends say the mighty jinn king still lies buried in the sand sea. They say that any who possess the lamp will find the world at their fingertips. But beware, gentle friends, for they also say that death will ghost the footsteps of any who lust after its forbidden power.